Welcome to the St. Louis Pan Expert Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Candy. I have with me here today, Tony Maritato, the owner of Total Solutions Therapy in Middletown, Ohio. He also is a worldwide expert on total knee replacement and has a trending channel on YouTube. Um, so he's going to give a little tip, some tips and advice that you can use if you're considering having a knee replacement, if you've had one recently or in the recent past. So um, thanks for joining us, Tony. Dave, thanks so much for having me on. So you see a lot of patients in your clinic that have had total knee replacements. How did you kind of come to subspecialize in that area? Yeah, you know, so just a little context on me. I started back in 2001. I was a personal trainer, strength coach. Um, I started a little personal training studio in Sarasota, Florida. And so many of my clients were active aging adults. They love tennis and they love golf. And like most people, they were developing some osteoarthritis. And I just found that it was fascinating to me because now we see the studies coming out, but you would see an individual with severe osteoarthritis, but no pain or limitation. And conversely, you'd see people that were doing phenomenal, but they had severe pain, but nothing showed up on imaging. So it really just didn't make sense. And we would develop treatment strategies in the clinic. Um, and what I found was that it really came back to a holistic approach. It was food, it was sleep, it was lifestyle, in addition to the exercise. And so that was my first kind of introduction into the world of knee specific treatment plans for osteoarthritis, which progressed to knee replacements. Um, I had the good fortune of working with some great orthopedic surgeons down there. They let me observe some surgeries. And as time developed, I realized that therapists have very different approaches to both prehab, post-op rehab. Um, and I wanted to bring kind of my experience to the forefront because I think what we do best as therapists, you know, is bring our experience to our patient. I see hundreds and hundreds of people who have had a knee replacement. I've got lots of case history, but if I'm going to see a patient in the clinic, they might only have a, a brother that had a knee replacement. And so they can't really look at, you know, what is normal, what is not normal, what can they expect? And that's where we kind of focus most of our time. So you mentioned early on about, uh, people who have a lot of knee arthritis and do just fine. And then people who have very minimal findings, but yet are in debilitating pain. Um, how do you determine, you know, if you're someone who has knee pain and also happens to have some knee arthritis, if a knee replacement is the right thing for you? Yeah, I've talked to a lot of orthopedic surgeons because just like, you know, any profession, if a hammer is your only tool in the toolbox, everything looks like a nail. So we've come to, to realize over time that pain alone is not a great indicator of somebody who absolutely needs a knee replacement. And so if I could kind of categorize and formally categorize individuals, you, you have your individual who was in a traumatic event. They fell off a ladder, they got into a car accident, there's been bony changes to the anatomy, and because of that, their, their knee structurally doesn't have the integrity to support their activities. They need a knee replacement. But oftentimes, we can see cases where an individual might have severe pain, but mechanically, everything looks and works pretty well. Um, those are the cases in which maybe a more conservative approach is better. We try to change some of the chemistry. You know, people understand, well, if I take a, an over-the-counter anti-inflammatory, it changes my body chemistry. But exercise does an amazing job at changing chemistry too. And a lot of times patients with pain will say, well, it's, it's miserable first thing in the morning. I could barely move. It takes me an hour or two to get moving. Then I've got this honeymoon period, late morning, early day, where I feel the best, almost no pain. And then into the evening, it's a debilitating pain again. Um, and typically what I find with those cases is that if there's ever a time in the day that the knee feels pretty good, it's probably mechanically sound and we're dealing with chemical problems that you can start to learn to manage and make changes with a good exercise program, seeing a physical therapist that could look at the big picture and, and kind of take 
case history and, and create a plan of care. Um, whereas when you have the individual that genuinely has a mechanically unstable knee, this is the person that takes a step and the knee just buckles or they feel like they don't have the control, they don't feel safe, they've maybe fallen a couple of times. Um, this, the, these are the factors that go into the decision of, okay, now I've got a mechanical problem, it's probably time for a mechanical fix, but you can't use any single factor. So imaging alone can never be the only factor that determines now it's time for a knee replacement. Pain alone can't be the only factor. History can't be the only factor. You really need somebody who's going to take the time to get to understand the individual, the patient, understand the family dynamics, understand the, the social pressures that are going on. Is this you know, an electrician who's still working, who can't take three to six months off of work because their, their family is dependent on that income? Is this somebody who has plans for the future and you know we had a situation where somebody wanted to go on a an alaskan cruise it was planned for months everything was set up this was obviously before the current pandemic and they had a choice to make they they were gambling rolling the dice a little bit to say hey i've got three months do i want to roll the dice and get the knee replacement heaven forbid there's any complications and hopefully i can do my cruise or do I want to put those three months into a conservative care program with a therapist and maybe massage and, and a couple other adjunct services, get to where I can handle the hiking and biking and all the things that I want to do in Alaska, and then have the surgery after, you know, like these are these are the tough decisions that I think patients clients need a professional who has had experience and seen 100 or 1000 cases to help direct some of those decisions. Are there any specific prognostic factors that you notice that, hey, this person's likely to do pretty well, or this person has this, that, and the other going on? They're, they're probably not the best candidate. Yeah, um, I find that in, in, in this applies beyond just knee replacement. I, I find that it applies to low back pain when somebody's going to have a spinal fusion, rotator cuff repair when somebody's going to get surgery. Um, but typically what I find is that when somebody can really kind of localize the symptoms, the impairment, the pain, um, it, it's kind of almost to the point, I always ask my patients, can you use one finger to point to the spot that's causing you the most discomfort? And if they always open up their hand, they say, well, it's this area. Th that's not specific enough, you know? So the individual that has a very clear case history, a very point specific problem that we can tie to mechanical issues, the mechanical solution of surgery tends to work incredibly well. Um, but the individual that's had long term persistent generalized pain and often in the clinic, you probably hear this too. I, I'll do manual therapy on somebody who comes in for knee pain and I'm checking the hip and I'm checking the calf and a couple other areas and the patient will tell me. I had no idea I was tender in those spots. You know, my IT band, my hip, my glute meat, I had no idea that I was painful up there. Well, the body, the body accounts for all those tender spots and all those sensitivities. So even if we did fix the problem at the knee, we have all these secondary impairments that are going on that aren't gonna be resolved with surgery. And so many times when I see a story, I run a, a large Facebook group. It's got over 6,000 members that have had knee replacements. And I get to hear a lot of case histories. Quite often when somebody says, I have a different pain now after the knee replacement, sometimes worse, sometimes not, it's usually because of those secondary problems that the knee replacement couldn't resolve. The, the hip bursitis, the IT band issues, the pes anserine bursitis, like there's so many other things that a lay person, a normal client really doesn't have the training or education to identify it. I talk to my mom, if I, if she tells me her knee hurts, it could be anything below the hip and above the ankle. Like there's 900 structures that we could be talking about, but to my mom, it's her knee, you know? And so that's probably the biggest indicator is like, listen to the case history. How point specific is the problem? Does it make sense that these are mechanical issues alone or primarily at least that we're dealing with? And did somebody 
make sure that we're not looking at a hip, a low back, an ankle, you know, pathology that's going on that's contributing to what's going on at the knee. Yeah, that's that's great. And I, I don't know whether that's just from personal experience that you've noticed that, but there's actually several studies that, that validate that. One, people that are just more tender in their forearms and just their body's more sensitive to pain than, than yeah. the average person um, tend to not do as well. So if you can isolate it, um, what about psychosocial factors like uh, anxiety, depression, how do those play into it? They're huge. We see that constantly. I share quite a lot of content trying to help individuals before surgery. You know, this is a major life event. I mean, we talk about, I think it's getting married, having a child and buying a house as three huge life events that are major stressors. Well, getting your leg chopped off and sewn back on is another one. And so when I'm looking again through my group and through my associates and peers, anxiety, depression, so many of these psychosocial factors come into play. Finance is a huge one. And so we need to treat this with the, the importance that it holds in the sense that Yes, there's exercises we can do to prepare for the surgery, but there's also other things that we need to do. We need to make sure we have the support system in place. We need to make sure that, you know, all the loose ends are tied so that when my client gets home, there's somebody there ready to greet them. They're fully aware of what they're going to have to do and what to expect. We want to kind of hope for the best and plan for the worst. And with that, I always talk to patients about season, right? I, you know, here in Ohio, we have some moderate winters, but still, do I want to be in a situation where I'm walking on ice to go to a physician follow-up after my knee replacement? Do I want to get it in the spring or the summer? Like, how do I plan for that? If I have insurance concerns, do I want to get it done in January so that my deductible and out-of-pocket is met for the rest of the year? Should I run into complications? Um, I think preparing mentally, emotionally, am I going to be ready to go two, three weeks without good, a good night's sleep? You know, one of the most common complaints in the knee replacement support group is I haven't slept for three weeks. I'm miserable. I'm grumpy. My spouse, you know, I'm, I'm short tempered. It's not fair to the people around me. How do I deal with this? So knowing that those other things are, are going to be an influencing factor on your recovery is huge. And anything you can do to prepare for that is going to make a big difference. Now, you mentioned season too. And one of the common things that people with both knee arthritis and replacements talk about is, oh gosh, when the weather gets cold or when it starts to get humid out or when a storm's coming, my knee starts to hurt more. Why is that? So I did some research on how weather affects the joints. And I can tell you 20 years ago when I was a new grad working in the clinic for the first time, you just chalk it up to old wives tales. Um, but there's absolutely some, you do a PubMed search, there's some clinical data out there talking about whether it be barometric pressure, or whether it be other factors going on. Now, in theory, when they do a knee replacement, they're removing the cartilage, they're taking the ends of the bone off. Um, you could make the argument to say, well, the, the stuff that used to cause pain is no longer in there. It shouldn't be affected by seasonal changes, but we're humans. We're, we're a system. We've got multiple joints, multiple, you know, systems that come into play. So I would still say, at least anecdotally in my clinic, patients will continue to experience changes in sensation when there's a storm front coming through, changes in sensation with you know, different weather patterns. And I will say, I, I am fascinated by the immune system. I think the immune system goes way under uh, discussed in physical therapy conventionally, but I can tell you that when I start experiencing seasonal allergies here in Ohio area, my orthopedic symptoms kick in like crazy. And so I always explain to my patients, think about the last time you caught a cold, viral, bacterial, whatever your immune system was dealing with. I bet the first symptom was orthopedic pain. Either your back hurt, you felt stiff, oh, your joints were achy. And then you realized, oh, I've got a fever, a runny nose, I'm sneezing. It's because the immune system is so important in all components of human body function that I think that the immune system, like I, I tell you right now, 
middle of uh, spring when allergies kick in, my patients who had been doing amazingly well, all of a sudden get a flare up or an exacerbation. It's not because of the biomechanics. It's not because of the orthopedic stuff. It's because of the immune response, the histamine to the pollen and the grass and the other stuff that's going on. And that falls right into line with you know, pain being an indicator that, hey, you should do something to change your current situation, you know, whether it's we're sick or whether, hey, it's getting cold out. And, you know, back when we didn't live in nice heated houses, cold could be a major you know, environmental hazard. So sure. you know, how, do, how does your body respond to that? And how does it give you a signal? And knee pain or shoulder pain is something we're familiar with. I'm having a, a cold or an immune response or something like that may not be as familiar of a, a signal. So let's say that you've decided that, yes, I, I do need to have a knee replacement. How do you go about getting ready for preparing for it? And then you know, what to do in the coming weeks afterwards? I think it's great that technology exists where we can do our own research now. We can take a more active role. So without a doubt, you know, I've been fascinated too by this question of how do you choose your surgeon? What are the factors you look at? Where, where do you go to find information? I think the surgeon is a huge component, obviously, of the recovery process. Your PT team, whether it's a single therapist or a group, huge important factor in what's going on. But basically what I'd be looking at is there are a lot of resources out there that will help you prepare. Um, but I would start interviewing local therapists. I would start with the therapist simply because the therapist has the time to spend with you, to answer your questions, to get to know you, to really understand, you know, are you going back to an apartment or a home? Are you going back to a place with stairs or a single level? Like all of these different things the therapist is going to take into account. So I usually recommend within about ideally 90 days, but at the minimum 30 days before surgery, find a therapist that you like. And any therapist who you want to work with, they will take the time to talk to you a little bit, talk to you on the phone. If you have Medicare, Medicare will pay for you to get in and do an initial evaluation um, before surgery and then another evaluation after surgery. But the therapist really should be kind of the integral part of your team because you're going to spend hours and hours and hours with this person you need to know them you need to like them you need to trust them you need to know that when they ask you to do something challenging they're doing it for your own benefit and do you need a therapist who's going to push you and be more of a drill sergeant or do you need a therapist who's going to be more of a cheerleader there's there's different personalities out there um, you want one that you can trust so i would first connect with the therapist interview a handful of them, figure out the one that you're going to work with. Then I choose my orthopedic surgeon. Same thing. I want a personality that I can connect with. They're all going to have a basic competency. There are some newer techniques using robotic assisted um, knee replacements. You can look into some of that. It just depends on where you live in the country. And then I would look at setting aside a three month recovery. Nothing good happens quickly and nothing good happens easily. Hopefully four weeks, six weeks, you're doing amazing, but have three months so that you're not pressured. You don't feel like you have to rush through the rehab process and really take this time, you know, make it an experience, make it a transformation, not just for your knee, but for you as a human being. I always say the patients that I see, see do the best are the ones that have a bigger reason than just themselves. Like knee pain, arthritis, yes, they're major factors for you. But what if you're recovering, you're rehabbing your knee because your plan is to take the family on a family vacation that you couldn't do last year because you knew your knee wouldn't let you walk on the beach in the Caribbean or it wouldn't let you hike the mountains in Alaska. That's your goal. Okay, that's what I'm moving toward. That's, that's my light at the end of the tunnel. I'm going to, while I'm recovering, I'm going to read books about my trip. I'm going to plan the destinations. I'm going to reward myself each time that I, I reach a, a milestone in recovery by buying something or doing something that's going to move me closer to my goal. In this case, the trip to Alaska or whatever it is. But I think you have to have that kind of bigger experience outside of you to move you, motivate you, reward you, to make it a more pleasurable experience. Because if, if you're just doing it 
to get rid of the arthritis and then you're like okay now what you know it's just kind of you don't have the same motivation and excitement joy I love uh, BJ Fogg, Tiny Habits is a great book for anybody who's thinking about going through an experience like this. It'll help you in the process of when you do your physical therapy, turning them into tiny, ha tiny habits, connecting them to things you already do in the day. I love Atomic Habits. Um, I think his name is Clear. I can't remember his first name, but, you know, find find the books, find the educators, find the people that you can connect with to really get the most out of this experience. You mentioned BJ Fogg and the, the tiny habits, and there's a great, you know, five, 10 minute Ted talk uh, out there yeah. that uh, for anyone who wants a, a brief introduction into that, um, about how doing two push push-ups a day can get you uh, into better, uh, better exercise shape after a year. So uh, something great to check out. And I think you're, information about planning for the knee replacement three one to three months ahead of time is great and you know kind of counter to a lot of times how things go where okay doctor says i need a knee replacement my knee hurts doctor says i need a knee replacement we'll have it on this date and we'll kind of see how it goes and <laughs> at least in this part of the country that's how things go a lot of the time versus right okay, I know I want to have this for this reason, so I can do this better with my family. And here's my plan at the end of, of the whole situation. And these are my steps to get here at one month, two months, three months. Um, and then reward yourself, like you said, for those, those achievements. Yeah. You know, it was James Clear is the other author of Atomic Habits. He references BJ Fogg. I remember the TED talk exactly the way you're talking about it. And that's a huge component of what we do in the clinic. Like when I talk to my patients about doing certain exercises post-op or even pre-op, I explain to them, I'm like, look, don't think of this as a 30 minute workout twice a week. It's not, it's these frequent micro exposures. We're dealing with chemical problems in the knee. So every time you sit on the commode, if you're female, you're going to sit on the commode a couple of times a day, at least if you're drinking enough water, tie that to, okay, every time I sit on the commode, I'm going to do this exercise, whatever it may be. Every time I brush my teeth, I'm going to do this exercise because I'm going to do it twice a day at minimum. You just, you tie those things in, you get these little micro exposures. On my YouTube channel, I talk about and share a lot of videos about using a rolling pin to do some self-massage. I massage the thigh, the calf, the muscles around the knee. It feels amazing. We do it pre-op, we do it post-op. If I was going to credit a single thing in my practice of 21 years that has been revolutionary, it's a simple rolling pin massage, you know? And so you find these little things that resonate, that click, that have huge benefit with relatively low cost and you do them and you repeat them and it just makes the whole experience that much better. Yeah, I can't agree more with that. And people get so caught up in the details of well, three sets of 10 or yeah. two sets of 15 or you know, just do them and do them regularly. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. So after you know, you've had surgery, you know, what are the next steps? What are the big things people need to know um, as they come home from surgery and in the next couple of weeks afterwards? Sure. So I think that, you know, I use this as a major impetus, impetus for big change, right? Okay, we know we need to eat better. I don't know anybody who's over the age of 40 who doesn't believe they need to eat better. Um, so preparing your meals, having some frozen meals that are easy to throw in the microwave or warm up, having laundry done, having your bill bills paid, those are all major factors that you wanna just get done, get out of the way so that you can come home and focus on recovery. Most patients are going to sleep in a recliner immediately after surgery, just because it's kind of the most comfortable position for them. And if you don't have a recliner, there are some really inexpensive wedges and different things you can buy for the bed. But the idea is we want to make the environment conducive to healing. Um, within that, the number one that thing that I always explain to my patients and most of the local surgeons do as well, get up and move understand that there are two major factors. There's a cemented knee and a cementless knee. In either case, 
once the surgery is done, for the most part, the knee is in place, the knee is solid. Most clients are going to get a cemented knee replacement, which means that it's solid. It's not going anywhere. Patients come home very fearful, justifiably, but the reality is the most important thing is to move. So my little tip is if you're drinking enough water, you're going to get up and go to the bathroom at least once every two hours to the point that it's annoying. That's a great rehab thing to do at home. You know, you have the ability, most patients don't realize this, you have the ability to find a therapist that will come to your home, not a home health therapist, your insurance may or may not cover home health, but you can find an outpatient therapist who will come to your home. Uh, Medicare covers outpatient therapy delivered in the home or in a clinic. And so a lot of times, if you find a therapist that comes to your house those first couple weeks, you're not driving in most cases, so you don't have to worry about arranging transportation. You can work a flexible schedule with your therapist, so maybe they come after normal hours or they do something else. But now the other component is if that therapist comes out to the home, they bring you peace of mind, they look at your incision, they tell you everything looks great, they help you with positioning and understanding how to set up your home environment so that you're comfortable they can also set you up with the opportunity to provide a video telehealth service into the future. So what we do here locally is if we have an individual that's returning home and they're not getting conventional home health, pretty much none of the orthopedics here do conventional home health anymore. One of us, somebody on my team will arrive at the patient's home when they arrive from the surgery center. We'll help get them set up. That's the beginning of their therapy care we'll make sure that they have the technology in hand so that they can literally push a button and we can start a telehealth video session the next day. And so we might do day number one in person in the house and then day number two, three, four, and five, just a 15 minute check-in using a video platform like this. So we can see the incision, we can monitor the swelling, we can answer any questions and we can bring that patient peace of mind. The beautiful part about this is Maybe you live in a remote area where you can't get therapy in the home every single time, or maybe it's just too challenging to get into the clinic. This allows you to use that technology. And if it's an older patient, maybe a patient that's not very tech savvy, most people will have an adult son or daughter who can at least help them navigate the technology. But like I said, if the therapist can come to your home, either meet you on your way home from the surgical center, that's like the dream scenario, or at least within a day or two of getting home, um, your therapist will set you up with the technology so that you can at least, I mean, at the bare minimum, you can pick up the phone and talk over the phone, you know, but telehealth video face-to-face -face is covered by Medicare right now and, and opens a lot of doors for a lot of individuals especially patients that are returning home without adequate support systems. You know, we don't all have friends and family that can come over and stay with us for two weeks. So having a therapist available through the technology is really a huge benefit. Especially like if you said they're familiar with your case before you go in and you've met with them yeah. prior to surgery. Yeah. Now, I know you're kind of running a little short on time, but could you briefly give a few tips to people who have had yeah, sort of failed, quote unquote, knee replacements, so what they can do after maybe six months to a year and they're still having trouble. And then we can yeah, send them links to your YouTube channel and Facebook yeah. group to get any other resources they may need. Sure. So, so I actually do see quite a few um, patients that are frustrated, we'll say, with their outcome. Of course, I've got the patients that just do amazing. I just had a gentleman, he was a mail carrier. Um, on his feet, you know, walking his route, route for 20 plus years. He had a knee replacement on Monday. He came to my clinic on Tuesday and I, I thought he didn't do the surgery because he walked in normally. He had no indication that he had a knee replacement. I mean, just crazy success. And he did really well the rest of the time. But I do see a lot of individuals who are frustrated, who do have complications, who don't get the outcome that they're looking for. And I think once you kind of, you know, there's a normal progression to the recovery and I've got some videos that talk about it in detail, but essentially, 
you kind of go through, you, you get the surgery done, you get home first 24 to 48 hours, you still have a lot of the anesthesia effects and the medication that they gave you during surgery. It, it's kind of not too bad. And, th and then it gets a little bit worse. The pain gets a little more intense, throbbing, aching, soreness, the swelling kicks in. Maybe you're not moving as much. Maybe you're starting to dehydrate a little bit. Um, but we kind of go through these waves of getting better, getting worse. But over the first 10 days, the 10th day should be better than the third day in most cases. And then, you know, the 30th day should be better than the 10th day. And so even though you get bad days and good days, there's more good days into the future. Um, I find that once we're starting to hit that like 10, 12 week mark, if you're not getting the range of motion you want, and I've got lots and lots of cases in which I'll see a patient in my clinic five days a, a week, six, 12, 18 weeks. I know they're putting in the effort, the time they're doing absolutely everything right. And they're still not getting the range of motion. And of course, those patients are getting frustrated. They take it on themselves. They feel like they're a failure. Um, but the reality is the body is going to do what the body does. We don't have as much control over our body as we would like. And so once you get past that 12 week mark, you know, if, if you're not 100% where you want to be and, and not 80% of where you want to be, we need to start looking at other factors. So always we want to look at, is there any possibility of an infection? You know, there's no good testing. I've interviewed a couple orthopedic surgeons. There's just no good testing for infection. They look at certain blood factors, but at the end of the day, it's still a little bit of a guessing game. We want to look at the implant. We want to say, well, is there any chance that there's a failure, mechanical failure that's going on? Is there any chance that there's a sensitivity within the body to some of the materials used? And as we go down the list and we start to rule these things out, back to your original point, Dave, sometimes our nervous system just becomes more sensitive than we would like it to be. And so we need to start looking then at those factors. Maybe the, the knee mechanically is doing great. The chemistry around the knee is doing great. Everything related to the knee is doing great, but you, the patient, still feel lots of pain, lots of frustration, numbness, tingling, all of these other symptoms. We have to look at the bigger picture then. And that's, again, when it's important that you have good communication with your surgical team, your surgeon, that you trust that person. Um, but then also that you have a rehab team in place so that you can go to your therapist and be like, look, what, what is going on? Where, where else can we look? What other factors can we bring into account? Um, and just if, if I was going to leave you guys with one major message that I've learned over 21 years of doing this, I've seen patients do everything technically wrong and do amazingly well. I've seen patients do everything technically right and have extremely challenging outcomes. And I've seen everything in between. The reality is we just don't have the control over our bodies that we want. And so even in the cases we do everything right, sometimes the outcome, the stat that's pretty much accepted industry-wide is 20% of people who have total knee replacements are never happy with the outcome of their knee replacement. That's a big, big number. And I don't think patients are necessarily prepared for that. That's why I said you kind of have to go in hoping for the, the best, but planning for the worst. Well, thanks so much for that. I'd love to dive a little deeper into that, but I know we're short on time. So for people who uh, want some more information, how can they access your numerous resources and your Facebook group and YouTube channel? Yeah, so the easiest way is you can go to YouTube. If you type in Total Therapy Solutions, you'll find the knee replacement channel. Um, but also, if you just start typing in stuff around knee replacement, I've got over 600 videos on the channel. I'm probably going to come up. You can go to <laughs> you can go to Facebook. We have a a Total Knee Replacement Support Group for kind people. And we're on Facebook. It's totally free. We've got over 6,000 members. People are sharing stories and accounts of successes and failures almost every single day. 
And then of course, my personal website, totaltherapysolutions.com. You can find resources and lots of free content on there. But at the end of the day, you know, I just happen to be the therapist that started sharing the content. There are phenomenal therapists all over this country that are more than eager to help. And I would tell you if, if, you know, don't forget about the occupational therapists. Occupational therapists do a phenomenal job helping people after total knee replacement. They bring a different perspective. They bring a different personality. And anytime I get the opportunity, I try to involve an occupational therapist in with the physical therapist on the recovery team. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and information with us today, Tony. And uh, Dave, hope you thank have you. Have the rest of your, great rest of your day. Absolutely. Thanks so much.